Have you ever felt that you just don't fit in? Struggling to make connections in a social group can be difficult. But what if you're clashing with an entire ecosystem, such as the plight of an invasive species? The hammerhead flatworm comes from far off lands, but it may be making a home in your own backyard, eating something that you take for granted. But sometimes the most resilient creatures overstay their welcome in life, death, and taxonomy. Welcome back to Life, Death, and Taxonomy. It's your 30 minutes of interesting animal information. I'm Joe. And I'm Carlos. Thank you to Cassie for the creation of our theme song. To hear more of Cassie's music, please search Cassie Michelle on YouTube or Spotify. And thank you to Johanna for the creation of this week's artwork. To check that out, you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter at LD Taxonomy or visit us at our home on the web at LDTaxonomy.com. And a very special thank you to our patron supporters. Uh, our Patreon supporters, uh, Tristan Taylor, Jesse Raspolich, Carol Raspolich, and Paul Chomo, thank you so much for your support. It's greatly appreciated. Thanks for helping us keep the lights on. And today we're talking about a flat, slimy menace that will not go gently into that good night. But more on that later. Definitely going to rage. <laughs> rage against the dying of the light. Yeah. But... We're talking about the hammerhead flatworm. We've done a lot of worms recently. Worms are gross and interesting. Yeah. That's all you can ask of them. That's all I have asked of them, (laughs) actually. And they've delivered. Uh, They're either like these crazy, horrifying parasite things, or they're just like beautiful underwater, uh, like sparkly boys. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it's... It's all and everything in between, um, but yeah, the, he- the hammerhead flatworm. That sounds like an undersea sparkly boy, but it's not. Um, it's also known as the broadhead planarian, which sounds like a schoolyard put down for astronomers. <laughs> like, ah, look at this broadhead planarian with his head up in the galaxies, in the stars. Um, but. No, it's just, it's just what they're called. Actually, all uh, everything in the genus is called a uh, broadhead pl- planarian or just ham- hammerhead worms in general. Um, but we're going to call it here the Uzi Uroboros and the Sogumbo- Soggy Bottom Ploys. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've more on that later. Soggy. It looks, it's a, it's a very slimy looking um, friend character. But is he satisfying? <clears throat> That's the question. Um, only he can say. <laughs> Literally. Um, the, let's taxonomize this. It's in a kingdom you know, live, and are in. That kingdom is Animalia. The uh, phylum is... I just like my my brain just puts chordata in there, but it's not chordata. This is a worm. It is platyhelminthes. It, it it was just such an odd phylum that it actually doesn't have a class. I don't know. Did you find a class for this this thing? Uh, I did I, not deign to look. I found a subphylum. Rab Rabdidophora, but I could not find a class. It always went straight to order, and that order is to order. Uh, tr- to order. To order. It's tr- tricladia. Tr- tr- tricladida. Sorry, tricladida. Tricladida. Um, the f- family is Geoplanidae. The genus is Bipallium. And the species is Coenzi. It sounds Japanese, but it's called... So the nomenclature is Bipallium Coenzi. Since we're in the business of naming things, 
It's time for my favorite part of the show, n nitty gritty nomenclature. Because this is a worm, and we've done so many worms that we already know what a worm is, <laughs> uh, a term of energy is. So, I couldn't find anything for Quincy, but let's find out what bipallium means. Or bipallium, however you want to pronounce it. So, Joe, what does bipallium mean? Does it mean double shovel, A, B, two hammers, C, two lines, or D, digested twice? <laughs> By the way, I found a class. Did you? Turbularia. Taxonomy is fun. Well, you said you said that you couldn't find a class, and it's in Turbularia, in the order to, to T U R B E L L A R I A. In the subphylum Rhabditophora. So it's weird that it's not listed. Maybe it didn't want any um, calls. It, I mean, it, it, it just wants to really distance itself from a cl from being from classist. Class. Yeah, you know what? Maybe it didn't have a great time in high school. And, you know, it wants to move on from its, from its class days. Anyway, I'm going with two lines. Two lines. So, bipallium means two lines. Sure. That's what you think. Final answer. That it's that's the final answer. The, and that is that's incorrect. The answer is double shovel. Ah, I didn't remember that option. <laughs> Prepare for shovel, make, make it, it double. double. Yeah. Interesting. But yes, if you see a picture of this of this guy, um yeah, I can see what where, where they're where they're coming from on that. Kind of. Um in that same vein, do you want to hear what this guy looks like? Of course. Alright, so there isn't all that much to say. It's pretty easy to define. This looks like a wet slime with a portobello mushroom attached to its head. Same. Um really? Someday. You've changed. <laughs> you have changed. Now now that's how you sell the Patreon exclusive video episodes. <laughs> <laughs> it is clickbait. It is not true. But uh <laughs> I mean we say things like, oh you like the cool shirt or sweater or hat or something that we're wearing or like what's in what's in our deluxe studios. But if I was a mushroom headed planarium, you'd want to see that. I would want to see that and I would most definitely um support their my favorite podcast on Patreon by going to LD or patreon.com slash LD taxonomy to uh to see this portobello mushroom head headed <laughs> host. The the hammerhead flatworm is the most delicious shade of greenish yellow with black stripes going down the length of it. Um but its most defining feature is this flat half circle shaped head um it it's it is exactly one half of a circle <laughs> just kind of just imagine a worm and then just the flat side of a half of a semicircle is just attached to the end of that worm um it and i don't think it looks very much like a hammer i haven't seen too many hammers that look like semicircles um but it does look like a very wide shovel to me hmm. you may be a big snow shovel and that's why I get it. That's why, I, like, I understand that bipallium means double shovel and not double hammers. <laughs> but this is actually one of the biggest um, planarians in the world. At least on land. So how big is it, Joe? Good question. 
Welcome to the Beloved Measure Up segment, the official listener's favorite part of the show. The part of the show when we present the animal size and dimensions in relatable terms through a quiz that's fun for the whole family. It's also part of the show that's introduced by you when you send in audio of yourself saying, singing, or chittering the words measure up into ldtaxonomy at gmail.com. We don't have a measure up intro this week that is new. So that means we need to look gun. back into the archives to find our greatest hits. Now, I don't remember this one, but it's from Johanna, my wife. And it says, the most annoying measure up. <laughs> so I already know this is going to be good. With, I mean, I've already heard it, so but I, just, I don't remember it. Without further ado, the listener's favorite part of the show. So, I don't know why I don't remember that. That was this. That was comedy gold. <laughs> that is the squeaky toy of uh, my mother-in-law, her mom's dog, who is here with us today, uh, just outside the door. Um, I think, yeah. or maybe on the couch. Uh, but that that toy is probably long since destroyed <laughs> by none other than you. No. <laughs> No, that's the good thing about it is like that sound, although annoying, it means eventual destruction for the thing making it. <laughs> they make those things super durable so that you get to enjoy those kinds of sounds for years to come. Not durable. Unless you have enough. a Rottweiler. <laughs> um but yeah. That's 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 a good measure up. Cuz you you hear this is the most annoying measure up and you anticipate like some like really annoying voice or something like that but nope <laughs> it's just this annoying sound and then her just cavalierly <laughs> saying measure up <laughs> yeah saying it out of suffering <laughs> <laughs> thanks good. johanna good one <laughs> <laughs> okay yes thank you let's talk length they're between 20 centimeters and uh, 20 centimeters. Um, I didn't have a range. I 20 and 20. 20 centimeters. These are pretty large for the for planaria. So they're on the upper end. How many hammerhead flatworms go into the height of the tallest geranium? Is that a flower? Yeah. Oh, good. These, uh, th- these f- particular flatworms were thought to be transported all over the world in potted plants. And in potting soil. Um, so here's a hint. A geranium is a genus that includes 422 species of plants. The tallest geranium ever was grown by Herbert Jones in Germany in 2010. I knew it was going to be Germany. I'm pretty sure the tallest sunflower is also in Germany. So Also, this one's just, it's called German, Germanium. Basically yeah. German. For all hobbits have a love of things that grow in in germany it's called deutschanium that that makes sense (laughs) it makes a lot of sense i made that up i don't think it's true (laughs) oh okay well never mind it makes a lot less sense because you made it up um so i i i I looked up what 20 centimeters is in freedom units and that's 7.8 inches For all of you people on this side of the pond. And I guess south of Canada. <laughs> um, answer is 15. 15. Is that answer final? That answer is so final. The... 15 hammerhead flatworms go into the length of this exceptional geranium. The true answer is 32.2 boy the geranium that is a tall geranium <laughs> was 6.5 meters or 21 feet and in three inches yeah that's ex- that is exactly a f- that's pretty much exactly a 15 per- a 50 percent for me <laughs> <laughs> 20 20 a two-story plant who would have thought 
I would not have. It's a flower. <laughs> yeah. It's probably like supported or something like that. There's no way it went straight up t- two stories. It has a lot of fans. Um, it gets a lot of emotional support. Uh, so yeah, probably it has a good, a good support system. Um, when you said it has a lot of fans, I'm like, does are they temperature regulated? <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's a width. Uh, and where there's a width, there's a there, way. Where there's a whip, there's a way. Uh, zero point one to zero point two inches. <laughs> is that the, is that a reference to the Ralph Bakshi Return of the King of course it song? Is. <laughs> oh my gosh! No, not the Ralph Bakshi, the Rankin and Bass. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Return of the King. <laughs> I saw that for the first time like a year ago. I saw that for the like, first time is... before. Actually, might have been like it at the height of the Lord of the Rings. I had watched the Rankin and Bass Hobbit like many times, but I didn't. I hadn't watched the the rest of it. Um, I really, and so I just watched the Return of the King. I really want to watch the like Nightmare Fuel, um, uh, mo, uh, not mo capped, uh, rotoscoped Lord of the Rings. That's the Ralph Bakshi version. Oh, okay, and it's and it's very bad. Yeah, that's why I want to watch it. It's almost unwatchable, though. Like, it's not even, like, a good, bad. Like, I, I'm enjoying making fun of this. It's, whew. It's, like, a, a lot. The scenes go on for, a, like, a really long time, a lot longer than they need to. And uh, the animation is actually pretty pretty good for that time. But the, all the rotoscoping and the live action stuff that they shoehorned in is just so bad. I, I, but Anthony Daniels is legless, so you can enjoy that. I uh, well once the rings and John of power, Hurt is Aragorn. Once the rings of power comes out, we'll we'll long for the days of the Road of the, <laughs> Lord of the Rings. No, I, I again, it's like I, I'm gonna I'm gonna be like those guys who who were like super into the original trilogy of Star Wars, um, and then the prequels came out and they absolutely despised them, and then the Disney trilogy came out and then they're like the prequels aren't actually aren't that bad yeah um that's gonna be me i'm super into the original lord of the rings trilogy hated the hobbit trilogy and now this lord of the this amazon show is gonna make me uh, appreciate the hobbit so i'm actually kind of looking forward to appreciating the hobbit because that's a lot of it's a lot of lord of the rings content that i can explore (laughs) um and then and then whenever they make the next thing we will have uh we have gone the way of the elves that just leave leave the leave the (laughs) by that time i'll just be dead yeah (laughs) <laughs> I will depart Middle Earth forever. We will very and, solemnly and sadly walk in a line towards the west, and and glow as much as we can. Yeah. Uh, anyway, anyway, let's talk with <laughs> you, this. This podcast is secretly a Lord of the Rings podcast and secretly a space podcast sometimes. So. <laughs> Space and Lord of the Rings and Eld- it, for a while it was also an Elden Ring podcast. Yeah, uh, but hot take: Elden Ring doesn't have that much replayability. Anyway, let's talk with zero point one to zero point two inches. That's zero point two to zero point five centimeters in uh, in 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 monarch units. How many hammerhead flatworms go into the thickness of the thickest part of the Earth's crust? The thickest part of the Earth's crust? Mm-hmm. Here's a hint. The thickest part of the Earth's crust is... Can you guess where? Oh, it's like a location. I thought it was like a, a layer no. of the sediment or something like that. Um, I, I don't know. The Himalayas? Yes, it's the Himalayan mountains in China. <laughs> oh, wow. Nice. Do I get a point for that? Let's I've... let's give you like five percent. Let's give you five percent. Oh, I extra get five percent. So I don't need an eight. What do I? I don't need an eighty-five. I need an eighty. Mm-hmm. Um. All right. Well, I do know that Mount Everest is, uh, I believe, thirty-six thousand feet. So I imagine that would probably be where the crust is thickest. Um, Not, the crust is thick as before the dawn. That's disgusting. <laughs> um, I don't know how <laughs> I don't know how big the rest of the crust is. I know it's not like compared to the rest of the Earth's 
cross section, it's not all that much. Maybe it's half that. Yeah, I guess we'll go with half that. I have no idea how thick the Earth's crust is. Um, 3.2 million. 3.2 million flatworms? Uh, that seems really low. But I'm gonna go with it because I don't want to. I don't feel like doing math anymore. Final answer. Forever. Yeah. Three point two million. The correct answer is fifteen million <laughs> flatworm widths. That five percent did nothing for me. The crust thickness is seventy-five kilogram kilo, kilometers kilometers. <laughs> that's that's forty-six miles. That's a deep dish crust. Yeah, that that is that is a Chicago style Chicago style mantle earth. there. That's yeah, a thick earth. That's all I got for two that. C's. Do you have any fast facts before we get into the major fact? I certainly do. So while they believe that uh, these flatworms originated in Southeast Asia. We've also been doing a lot of stuff that that's in Southeast Asia too. That that's area is rich for interesting animals. Yeah, um, a lot of rainforests, a lot of isolated places with islands and things like that. Maybe it's um, hemisphere not bias. a ton of industrialization. Is it hemisphere bias? We only care about wolves and bears and stuff. Well, no, I mean like we think that stuff that is not from our hemisphere is more interesting because it's it's unfamiliar. I don't know. The Amazon's pretty interesting, and that's in our hemisphere. Very true. Unless you're just going by the northern hemisphere. <clears throat> um, but we have a possum. Possums are pretty weird. It's the only marsupial in our con- on our continent. How to get? Why? It's a big, ugly rat that likes to play dead sometimes. But it's a marsupial. Southeast Asia has from? a millipede that spits acid at its prey. At its pre- uh, at its a. Uh, attackers marsupials are only supposed to be in places where like they couldn't adapt to be any better (laughs) they didn't need to adapt to be any better like islands island continents why are you a marsupial possum i'll ask the next one i see which may not be that long because they like to hang out in my backyard along with i saw a family i assume a family of um armadillos just in my yard could have been a book club just just yeah they they were there's probably a worm club because they were they were like truffle pigs sniffing around armadillos keep or they, they were a book club but they were all they were a book club but they were all reading dune because there's a bunch of worms in there <laughs> um and you need a book club for that book because it's crazy <clears throat> Anyway, so while the the hammerhead flatworm originated in Southeast Asia, they believe it's actually it's everywhere now because, as you mentioned, uh, it's been shipped all over the world via plants and planting plant soil. Um, and they're as I imagine you'll get into. They're very good at s- starting new populations from scratch. Um. You don't necessarily need a breeding population for them. Um, They pretty much just eat uh, earthworms as their main source of food. And surprise, surprise, earthworms are everywhere. Um, And so they will hunt by catching a worm and injecting it with a paralysis-inducing neurotoxin called tetrodotoxin. Um which is pretty unique among worms to have a neurotoxin that they use for prey. Um, and at the risk of stepping on your major toes, I think I'll leave it there. Okay. You can come back if I miss something. So I'm just calling the major fact I will survive. So. As with many troublesome invasive animals, because this animal is invasive pretty much everywhere, (coughs) except for uh, Asia, maybe. Um, Hammerhead flatworms do not go gently into that good night. 
Hammerheads have several unique survival tactics that even resist human attempts to destroy them. So they can survive for a long time without basic resources. Uh, They're able to store food and go for weeks on their reserves. When they run out of reserves, they eat themselves. In other words, they will cannibalize their own tissues to survive. Speaking of cannibals, they'll eat each other as well as other kinds of worms and flatworms. If it fits down their gullet, and it's a worm. They'll eat it, even if it's themselves. That's why I call them the Uzi Ouroboros. That's very true, yeah. They, they're, they're resistant to predators as well. Uh, you mentioned that they're venomous, but they're also poisonous, if you remember that distinction. Um, they, when you eat them, it's not good. And when they bite you, it's also not good. If something like your dog or cat were to eat one, they would they would get pretty sick. I don't I haven't seen that they are deadly to eat, like a bufo toad. Um, but there are reports of dogs eating the worms, throwing them up, and then the worms surviving. So we've talked about this before. Like, how does it help you to be poisonous? In this case, it's straight up you survive being eaten. True. Isn't isn't that uh Chock full of nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, I got sidetracked by laws about auto cannibalism. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's save that for the end because I also want to hear that. <laughs> um, uh, no, you... we don't need to because there are no laws against auto cannibalism. Oh, so if you bite your cheek and accidentally eat some of yourself, then you won't go to jail. Yeah, if you eat your, some people eat their scabs, apparently. That should be illegal. (laughs) One guy (laughs) has uh, baked his blood into, like, blood patties, which sounds like a very good idea. Blood patties is, should be illegal to say. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, I like that, or what is it called? Oh, black pudding. That's what they call it, um in in europe uh it's, it's just just a blood patty it's disgusting i mean <laughs> it, i don't want to yak yoke your yak but i tried a bl- uh, black pudding and i could not handle it um if you find one of these invasive guys so did we talk about why they're so bad <laughs> as an invasive species no so like they eat earthworms and you said that you, like you said, and earthworms are everywhere, like you said, and they're really important. They're good for soil. Um, you need earthworms in your soil to have good, healthy crops and stuff. They aerate so, it. Yeah. So it's kind of like bees where you need them for like agriculture and things of that nature. So earthworms are vital. And this flatworm that does not belong where it is, that can't be eaten by predators, um, kills them, kills and eats them. And uh, so that's bad. So if you find one of these and think uh, to dispose of them in order to save the important earthworms in your garden, definitely, definitely, definitely don't chop it in half. It's not snake rules. Uh, it, it, if you cut off the head of the snake, it'll make another snake in this case. These, these worms re- reproduce asexually, which means they don't need a buddy. They don't need another. They don't need another worm. They'll do it on their own. Um, through the, the the this particular style of asexual reproduction is called the budding. So budding, despite the fact that you don't need a bud, uh, budding is when a portion of an animal is broken off, and it grows into a new animal. So I think starfish do this. What else? Zoidberg. Zoidberg. Mm-hmm. That's all <laughs> so I can think of. <laughs> flatworms that are cut in two, three, or more pieces grow into as many uh, uh, as many new worms. So, if you cut cut it into three pieces, it'll cut, turn into three worms. I did not know that. Um, I thought that it was just kind of like a they do it once and then they have to like kind of re 
recuperate and grow again and then they do it again kind of thing i didn't realize that as many pieces as you cut them into is as many worms as you're gonna get i'm sure that there's a there's a limit um in terms of like just growing that you need resources so like i don't they, there's probably a certain amount of worm you need to make a new worm it's kind of like there's a certain amount of a like a paper dollar bill that you need in order for it to still be legal tender yeah, I, I didn't know that. Yeah, I think it's like sixty percent. Oh, is don't is quote that, me on it. <laughs> that makes sense. So you can't turn one dollar into two. Yeah, so you need more than half of the bill in order for it to count as a bill. But I don't think vending machines care. Yeah, <laughs> uh, gonna spit it back out at you, no matter what. So you, so you can crush the worm. But if you leave enough uncrushed, it will grow into a new worm. <laughs> it's um, a perfect organism. And it, also, they're extremely flat and extremely malleable, even more than a regular earthworm. So if you crush it on a flat surface or, or a soft surface, rather, like soil, like the thing it lives in, like the thing you might find it in, uh, you might not crush it at all or you might not crush enough of it. Just push it into the dirt. It's favorite place. Please don't throw me into that briar patch. Essentially, you need to throw it into the fires of Mount Doom. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this, this worm cannot be destroyed, Ghibli said of Gloin, by any craft that we here possess. It must be unmade. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, Alronda. I, I get it. Um, so... This malleability also allows them to get into and out of anything that isn't sealed well enough. If you throw one away in a tied-off grocery bag, they can get out of it. So, as a worm, they are vulnerable to one thing, and that is desiccation. It happens to vampires. It happens to this worm. Uh, when it's dried out, um, it has a bad time, like other worms. So even this isn't an extreme vulnerability. So they can lose up to 45% of their body weight in water without dying. It seems like they're mostly slime. So Yeah. So 45% is a, is a significant amount for you who are who is that's that's half of your water weight, right? What are we in water? 75 percent or maybe that's the earth i can't remember (laughs) um so if you if you need a reliable not quite half but it's it's close if you need a reliable way to dispose of an invasive flatworm the tried and true method is to seal them in a container with a pinch of salt which draws out more than 45 percent of their weight in water and then put that container in that like spinny catapult that throw th- throws things into the atmosphere. <laughs> well, the the person I was uh, I was watching um, a science a science woman um, talk about how to dispose of them, and she suggested keeping a resealable container and just putting some salt in it and keeping it like in your garage or something, and just tossing a worm in, in there every time you find it. Making Unless it bites jerky. you. <laughs> oh, I'm yeah. just going through with yeah, a flamethrower. <laughs> yeah, so fire would work. Uh, usually, like, f- fish and wildlife organizations and governmental bodies don't suggest, like, extreme. It's It's illegal. Like, invasive species are protected in one way, and that is against torture. Um, so... They don't suggest things that are would be torturous. I don't know how this worm is like uh, nervous mm-hmm. system works if it's possible to torture it. So, um, but so you, you put, aren't, aren't setting it on fire would be torture. But I don't know putting don't know. it in a sealed container with a bunch of salt and letting it slowly no, I think, dry up is. I not. think fire would probably be fine. Like if you like light like burn it a little at a time, that would be torturous. But if you like throw it on a campfire, I assume that would be pretty quick for it. Although it's wet, so it might not be quick. 
But like stuff for what is it? The bullseye snakehead. They said put it on ice and let it die that way. Yeah, which is slow. But they're not contemplating their mortality. It's just it's an it's all about mitigating pain. They are just panicking the whole time instead. <laughs> So Truther. they stress themselves to death. That's better. Very humane. Yeah, I mean, killing is killing. Just hit it against a rock. That for a snakehead. For a snakehead, not a, not not this. It yeah, work. this is not. That's not going to work on this on this boy on the hammerhead flatworm. Also, a gloved hand is pre- preferable, and uh, the back hand. Not, then wash it. An open wash hand. It well. Also, don't don't. Don't Winnie the Pooh style stick your hand in a jar of honey and eat directly from your hand after handling this worm. Because it might make you sick. It might make you sick, yeah. Uh, Have you ever done that? It's great. Have have I ever stuck my hand in a jar of honey and pulled it out and just licked it off? (laughs) That's sucked it out out of your paw stuffing. Yeah, that is that's like the stickiest situation I can think of. If I had a stuffed bear that came to life, I would be very upset with it. If it if it uh, did that to itself, because that's hard to wash out. Have you seen Christopher Robin? Yes, he does that, and and he, he, he does sticky. that, and it's like it's just it looks like it's just absorbing into his fabric, and it's it's like a horror movie. <laughs> We reference from that movie the uh, "Say What You See" game all the time. Oh, oh my gosh, we do it too. <laughs> whenever, <laughs> whenever like nouns start to appear in a row in a conversation, we always end up going "house tree." I don't know what that is. <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's that's the most enduring part of that also if efficient this in the sea instead of efficiency yeah anyway my my mom told me that uh that we go on too many tangents on this show <laughs> well this is she's, the end so she was like worry. i really wanted to i was really enjoying that last episode but uh like you guys were talking about all kinds of stuff that had nothing to do with the animal and i was like oh that's the, but other podcasts are the same. Some people listen for the tangents. Some people don't want them at all. It's hard to. Uh, Why don't we make like a poll or something? If people out there in podcast you want want to hear our tangents, or just want to hear, you know, a a, a quick and snappy thirty minute episode about just the animal and nothing else. So basically, if well, you want to have fun, or if you that... want to be boring. <laughs> I know for a fact that uh, Joy and her uh, her gaggle of children do not give two lizards tales about uh, Elden Ring. So there's, <laughs> there's depends on the tangent. I and suppose. you're going to have a hard time separating Calvin from two lizard, lizards tales. <laughs> That's his favorite treat to eat. <laughs> I think he's only tried it once. I don't know. Once you, once you try it. Put some put a little salt and vinegar on that. Well, that, that can make even like, crickets taste good. Or it smelled like chicken, so maybe some like Ooh, buffalo some, sauce, or much. like or sweet chili sauce. That sounds good. Mm-hmm. And then also some like honey roasted barbecue sauce from Chick Fil A. Mm. That goes great with lizard tail. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's all I got. All right, yeah, so uh, that is the Hammerhead Flatworm. Um, For you out there in Podcastia, stay slimy. Grab yourself an earthworm, and remember that you eat what you are, like the Hammerhead Flatworm here in life, death, and taxonomy. Hey Taxonomy Titans, I just want to remind you that we now have a Patreon. Patrons can see full video episodes and get shoutouts on the show. But ultimately, it's a way for you to help us cover some costs and get even better. Still, reviews are the best way to help us grow. So if you haven't left one yet, we'd really love to hear from you. 
As always, thanks for listening and engaging. Life, Death, and Taxonomy is my favorite in the world podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rather proud of that one. You are. That's pretty good. <laughs> I mean, I hope not. Unless you're a donut. <laughs>